All right, guys, thank you so much for the, the marathon. We'll continue. I think we're, we're in the last stretch. Uh, so. Oh, this is so much fun going like towards the end because I feel like, <laughs> you know, I, no, really, I'm like in a room of friends at this point. This is so cool. Um, I'm going to make this shorter than is planned on my slides because I'm clearly losing my voice. Um, but it's gotten better since this morning. Anyone who's talked to me this morning. I am April Raggio. I um, hail from upstate New York. I'm at the University at Albany. I'm a researcher with the Center for Policy Research there. I'm working with Dr. Pablo Islam Andreaga. He is with USM, Universidad Tecnica Santa Maria. So I don't know if you do this, right? This was so much fun. So if you put your Fulbright application into your favorite AI, do you have your favorite AI these days? I loved Bard, but Bard is no more. So now we have Gemini, who is not as friendly to me, I don't think, as Bard was. But this was actually fairly succinct. And I didn't want to make this like a crime novel. So this is what I'm doing, and we could end here if we wanted to. Um, but yeah, I wanted to be um, as succinct as possible. But I wanted to give you a little bit of background information. So. I think many of us in here, and I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions in a few minutes, just like Steve, um, we know that the current food production methods contribute significantly to the climate crisis. I think for most of us here, this is not a surprise. My team in New York has for a long time now considered the issue of relocalizing food systems as one potential solution. And I should tell you that over time, um, our thoughts around this is, have kind of changed, you know. Um, I have a colleague who um, jokes about my, my propensity to lean towards local food systems, and he makes fun of, like, the farmer's markets in the U.S., which, as many of you are probably aware, are sort of niche production places for the wealthy. These are not norm, despite the fact that we now accept SNAP benefits, you know, at a lot of farmer's markets. They're not the places where many people can actually access um, healthy, affordable food. So we've moved lately to more of this idea of regional food systems, of regional infrastructure. Um, the U.S. and Chile offer contrasting perspectives on this. And this is going to be re repetitive because I've been here with you now all day. So I've said this already to a bunch of you, right? However, um, in the U.S., we, had a, we have a giant agro-industrial kind of complex that for the last almost, I'd say, 80 years, has worked tremendously to provide a lot of food as cheaply as possible, but not particularly healthfully, right? And one of the results of that is that we don't have a strong local food system. We also don't have strong regional food systems for the most part. Um, my partner in Chile, when we first started talking about this years ago now, he said, well, we don't, we don't look like that here. Ours is a bit different that we have, um, and I think it's mostly because they looked away, they were focused primarily on mining and other issues, right? So their local and regional food systems, for one reason, um, were, they were distracted by other things. So there wasn't this urge to sort of eradicate the local food systems. We are fascinated by this because we have to do something in the US to figure out how we revitalize local and regional food, food systems. So oh, this isn't gonna work, Mason. So. Um, is it hooked to the internet? It is. So um, I don't know why this isn't working. Have you ever used Slido before? Ah, Steve, why isn't it working? So typically, <laughs> typically what would happen is you'd get a smart code. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's okay. We could do this by a show of hands. So I'm kind of curious, does your research involve some aspect of food systems? Yeah, so kind of a, a, quite a few of you. I have another question. The third one's going to be a little harder, but... Um, does your work in some way involve investigating sustainable development or resilience? I mean, this is pretty amazing, right? Make sure hands higher. I can't even see it there. <laughs> this is cool, right? Because we're kind of doomed, right? And, and it's so cool that so many of us are working on these really important issues. This is going to be harder. And this is so cool if it's a Slido presentation, right? Because you can actually log in and tell me what you think. But if you don't mind telling me, when I say collaboration, Tell me, what is your immediate reaction? Give me a word. Necessary. Necessary. What else? 
thumbs up. Do any of you not love the idea of collaboration? Well, I have a funny story I'm going to tell about that. Not everybody does. It's hard and it's messy. Yeah. So, I'm um, so sorry, this is falling off the screen. So this is my propensity to just stuff way too much stuff on one screen. So um, I will not go back to my undergrad years because I am way too old to, to talk to you about undergraduate work. But I finished my PhD in 2011. That happened to be one year into a five-year place-based experiment that I was running with my husband. We were actually operating a general store in upstate New York. We still own the building, so if anybody really wants to run one, I'd happily sell it to you. <laughs> <laughs> but in 2011, I finished a PhD. The following year, I had um, a set of twins. I had twin babies, um, unexpectedly. Um, and so, whereas usually the doors of academia um, to become a professor, open as soon as you leave um, with your dissertation. If you wait, don't wait. <laughs> it becomes a lot harder to do that. So I took a bit of a hiatus where we were focusing on our own place-based local food systems. In 2017, I reconnected with the University at Albany, and we've been doing a lot of local food systems work since then. Um, one thing that sort of... Um, provoked my efforts at Fulbright was that um, I have a friend, Paul Masing, who was hosted here last spring, who also worked with um, USM, with Pablo Isla Madrioca. Um, so he's sort of done a little bit of this work. He was, he was part of my team. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've done and how it intersects with some of the stuff we're going to be doing together. Um, one of these is this municipal efforts to re-globalize food systems in New York State. So anyone that I've been talking to about federal grant programs, so I have a pointer, this is so, this one and this one over here that we're still in the midst of, these were USDA grants, proposals. Um, the USDA hated them. The USDA's <laughs> reviews of these two were absolutely horrific, um, but we liked them. So we reformatted them and, and kind of reworked them for two other foundations, and they were both funded. So the New York Health Foundation um, was one of the most gratifying projects I have ever worked on. Um, this involved a mixed method study of uh, using um, of local food systems in New York State. Primarily what we did was talk to um, town supervisors and village mayors, right? So we did 38 full length interviews with, with folks in upstate New York about these issues. And then we followed it up with um, a survey of everyone so one, some of the outcomes of this, I'll tell you if you care. Do you care? Is this fascinating? This is yes. so cool. So this, this was so much fun because, you know, I'm, I'm this white woman going into, like, from, uh, you know, an R1 university, and, and there is this sense that you don't want to be, like, extractivist, right, when it comes to work like this. They welcomed us with open arms. For the most part, all of these people wanted to tell us about their food systems. So we would ask things like, where are your residents getting their food? What is your level of food insecurity? How are you distributing it? Are you producing your own food anymore? Um, we also asked things, and this ended up being one of the most compelling parts of this work. We wanted to know how they collaborated with each other. So some of what they said, I can give you like the bottom line on this. Many of them told us that food insecurity is not an issue in their place, which was distressing to my foundation, who knows data to the contrary, right? Um, they also um, sort of confirmed, validated some of what we already know, which is that in upstate New York, we're losing local farms, that there are very, very few local farms left. And the ones, the, the ones that they know about that are left are, off, are often massive farms. These are very, very big places. Um, and they also said things about how their, their, their folks were getting food. So, and this is shocking. This is not from necessarily my, just my interviews. This is from the, the survey of everyone as well. Um, they would say, we have in mass greater access to food pantries and to dollar stores, convenience stores, than we do to full service grocery stores, which is, which is a terrible finding. Um, but I can tell you some good news as well. So, so first of all, even though many, many places in upstate New York do not spend a dime on local food systems work, as in 94% of them said we never spend any money on any of these programs, so many of the, the cool programs, 
starting farmer's markets or building a food pantry or doing a community garden or things like that tend to be fairly low cost. And they're things that can be done by volunteers. And they also build social capital. So in these places, they did them, even though they really don't have the money to spend on them. They did them anyway. And this is about collaboration, Mason. So I asked a lot of questions about collaboration. I really wanted to, and this is why I really wanted to ask Brian about network analysis, because we've been doing some of that work as well. We found um, that about a third of the town supervisors and village mayors that we talked to, when I asked about collaboration, they would look at me perplexed. <laughs> and they'd say, why on earth would I collaborate with someone that's messy and unpleasant and I don't have to do it, so I don't do it. About a third of them were these amazing people that regardless of, of how much they're being paid, and often they're not being paid almost anything to do the, this work, they would pick up the phone and they would call their county, they would call their state, they would call federal representatives just to get the kinds of answers to the problems that, that they had at the, the municipal level fixed or answered. So that was kind of incredible. The third in the middle were these people who, if the state or the county provided just some mechanism to facilitate their own collaboration, they would rise to the occasion. So we have things like the sh a shared services program in New York, right, where we would say, okay, um, if you want to collaborate, we have this mechanism for you to do so. You call up this person, we'll help you do it, and we'll make it work. And in that case, they were like, sure. Absolutely. So one of the things that that taught us, right, is if we provide the, the sort of starting conditions, right, the fertile ground for people to collaborate, right, to go, if we test them, Steve, right, if we give them some, some instruction beforehand, they're often likely to do it. So I don't want to run out of time. So I just want to tell you about a few other. Um, so this one is one we are um, currently in the midst of. And this was my second USDA failed USDA proposal that was funded. Um, this was um, mechanisms for food system localization. If we really care about how the state is taking our money and then dispersing it to localities. And in New York State, we did this great experiment. We called it the Regional Economic Development Council model, where we um, essentially created like a Hunger Games for New York State, right? And we would force our regions to compete against each other. And you can imagine in your heads all sorts of problems with that model, right? Like some. Regions actually start out with a lot less resources than others. So they're not as well able to compete. I care about rural areas. So if you were to assess across regions, and most of my regions in New York State have both urban places and rural places, it looks like New York State did a fairly good job, right? It's fairly equitable. But then if you run the data in slightly different ways, right? If you if you compare lots of, um, if you compare all of my counties, for example, by their um, their NIH urban rural code, you find that actually um, rural places are getting maybe a quarter of the funding compared to urban places. And that's not necessarily a judgment. I mean, that's where the people are, right? We're spending a lot of money on, on these. But we also know that the big capital projects are being funded and there's far fewer big capital projects that are happening in rural areas. Despite the fact that our rural places have far less access to adequate um, you know, food, water, health infrastructure. They have often been, um, had their, their higher ed institutions removed over time. They're losing population, things like that. So, so there are things I'm not gonna talk about, but you should come up and ask me because I'm gonna run out of my, but so we're doing this, this is for Kate. So we're doing this amazing work in governing phosphorus in New York State, which is so much fun. Um, and we also care, for those of you who are working in the public health field, we care about um, the intersections between rural health and climate, which, um, so in upstate New York, we're, we're not suffering necessarily from droughts at all. We're suffering from extreme rainfall that just hits us suddenly. So there's been a lot of flooding. Um, and the last thing I'll say before moving on very quickly to what I'm going to do here is this comparison of governance mechanisms. So I'll leave you with this just because the Tug Hill Commission, it, they're, so, they're gonna be so amazed they get an international audience. So this is this tiny little place in upstate New York um, on one of our Great Lakes up by Watertown. And they have a, a small state agency called the Tug Hill Commission that has formulated councils of governments over time. So these are the structural mechanisms that we kind of discovered when it came to municipal food systems. They've literally created that. So for the past 30 years, there's groups of perfectly sized, can you know, 10 or 12 towns together that work together on issues like regional economic development, 
over time. And it's, it's kind of incredible. You wouldn't think that we would be so celebrating an issue as simple as collaboration. But without collaboration, we see that outcomes are, are much poorer. So that's one that's kind of coming up and that my colleague here is very interested in. Man, I wish I could figure out the formatting of, of these things, you know? <laughs> um, so our Fulbright goals are to understand the strengths and um, challenges of the Chilean local food systems. We're gonna compare our approaches. I think that there are some lessons that we can learn for, for building more resilient and equitable food systems in both places. Um, some of the, the outcomes are fairly conventional. We're gonna write a paper. Does everybody just sigh when I say that? Of course, she's gonna write a paper, right? But we also, some of these papers are cool in that I can write a, a paper that's like practitioner-based and we can disperse it to, to folks at, at, at like ground level, right? They might actually produce some, some cool results. Um, and we really wanna do some collaboration between um, more researchers and students in both of our countries. Um, with regard to methods for, you know, the space analysis I'm reading, we're doing a systematic literature review. Um, much of that has already been done. Um, this is, is kind of um, up in the air. I've constructed this whole interview protocol and my partner here is like, eh, do you really want to do that? So we're, we're working through that. Um, really what he is very, very eager to do is, is, is finalize some of these shared research questions and figure out how it is we fund over time. One minute left, four minutes left. I didn't know whether it's just subtract, you know, it's like, um, I didn't mention this, but part of my, my, um, my background is my PhD is, PhD is in uh, public administration and policy. So my background is in things like simulation modeling and decision sciences. So ideally, um, Pablo is eager to take part in some of the policy simulations we are creating, some of the policy models we're creating in the States and see how we can do comparative work with the local food systems here. I'm, I'm, so some of this is up in the air. He's like, do this. You're gonna participate in this graduate seminar and you can come in with me. Um, I don't think that, that we're gonna do a lot of, of um, th this work necessarily right now, but we're both eager to do it in the future. Um, what we're, we're both really excited about is, it's, this is weird because I actually talked to a bunch of you and they had the same experience. So when I um, started telling people that I had gotten this Fulbright Scholar Award, um, my team grew substantially. So part of what we're doing, and you can't really see this here, but um, is to share research findings and draw together students and faculty from multiple universities. So my universities are um, Rockefeller College, um, Johnson and Wales University. I, I teach also at, at RPI in Troy, doing data analysis and statistical work. Um, and I have, this is, this, is, um, this is for Kate too. So that's my soil scientist at SUNY Cobal Skill. Um, lately, we've connected with a scholar at University of Cape Coast in Ghana, who's also eager to talk about things like project-based learning and um, be able to share and create student workshops across virtually so that we have, we have an ability to, to share students back and forth. So I liked this just because it was part of the template and I'm like, oh my God, I should show them what we're doing later, you know? Um, but I told you what we're doing now. Part of the, the really exciting work for us is the things that are coming up even post this award. Um, so one of it I just mentioned is being able to identify the ways we can share our students. Um, RPI in, in Troy, New York looks a lot like USM here, their departments. So they're eager to be able to compare and contrast notes. Um, Pablo is coming to visit us at Albany this September. So we're not December. He tells me two days ago, oh, no, no, it's September. Um, and we wanted to continue to create this formalized research agenda. I think there's a lot of room for really cool stuff to happen in the future. Um, I am so thrilled that I made it through this without coughing. You have no idea. Um, and please, I love to collaborate. I don't groan when I hear the word collaboration. I'm excited, you know. So reach out to me. Let me know if you want to as well, because I'm eager to do it. Go ahead, you can clap, that's fine. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs>